Testing one, two. Can you all hear me? Yes. Amen. Well, then let me go ahead and say happy Sabbath to everyone. It is a true privilege to be here with you all. I am very grateful for the time that we can spend together worshiping God at this beautiful camp meeting, very traditional camp meeting. And I pray that the Lord raises up many more like them. And I'm very thankful for those who were instrumental in making this possible. It's been a privilege to work with my fellow workers, Brother Eric, Brother Chad, Brother Jai, May God continue to bless you all and your ministry. And of course, it's the Fadia as well. And it is a privilege to be here before you as we get ready to study the word. God has something very beautiful that he wants to share with each of us. I'm actually very excited about it. And I'm so thankful, especially for the way the Lord blessed my heart through my young brothers and sisters as they sang the Beatitudes. I mean, that was just such a wonderful demonstration. I am so grateful for our children that are continuing to serve the Lord, to honor him and to surrender their lives. May they all remain faithful. As we prepare our hearts to receive the word, and I know the Lord has a message for us, and so that's not my concern. My concern is that God gives you and that God gives me ears to hear what his spirit wants to say to the church. And so the best way to prepare our hearts to receive the message is in prayer. And so I'm going to go to my knees just one more time. I know we prayed not very long ago, but I'm going to do that just one more time for special consecration of myself. And I would like to invite you to consecrate yourself before the Lord as you prepare to hear his words. Let us pray together. Our loving Father, we are very grateful for this privilege and this opportunity that we can humble ourselves in your sight not merely by our body posture, but by the very source of our being. Lord, we recognize your greatness, and in the midst of that, we see our sinfulness. And we're so grateful that in the midst of us being guilty, you are still prepared to pour out your innocence upon us if we would just accept the gift. Father, I'm praying in the name of Jesus, please forgive us of our sins. Bless us with the gift of true repentance. And we pray for your Holy Spirit to minister so clearly to our minds that we will understand what you want us to receive at this hour right now. And I pray that we, as a result of receiving the word, will leave here different than when we came in. So this is our prayer that we humbly ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you have your swords in hand. We want to go to the book of Psalms. We want to go to Psalms, the 11th division, Psalms 11. And in Psalms, the 11th division, God makes a point to us that is so clear that I don't think we can miss it, even if we try. It is in Psalms, the 11th division, that the Bible makes a very profound point. And the Bible says in Psalms, the 11th division, and if you're there, please say amen. The Bible says, if the foundations be what? If the foundations be destroyed, what's the question? What can the righteous do? And the answer is nothing. When a foundation is destroyed, everything that is built upon it sooner or later will crumble. It is gonna, it's gonna fall. And it's amazing because today, you know, one time I was in Germany and I remember when I was in Germany doing some work out there that I got a chance to finally put my hands on something that I heard about for years. I heard that in the German culture, when they build a house, it is built on a very strong foundation. And as a result of that, everything above it is built very strong. And so I remember walking through the structures of some of their properties, and as I walked through it, I was able to knock and feel different areas of the home, and I saw that they were very sturdy, very strong. And it was at that point that I began to reflect back on how a lot of houses are built in America. And as I began to reflect back on how a lot of houses are built in America, I began to discover how weak our foundations are. 
And all it would take sometimes is a little bit of wind, some type of storm, and you would discover how weak the foundation was and the structure that sat on, pot, on top of the foundation. And it was just through that little simple example that I began to have a greater appreciation for what we just read in Psalms 11. If the foundation be destroyed, whatever structure you build on top of it, it will not last. It'll stand pretty on a beautiful sunny day, but all it takes is a little bit of wind. And wind's a very symbolic in scripture. All it takes is a storm. And all of a sudden, the beautiful structure that we admired and adored so much, we discover how weak it was because it did not have a sure foundation. The reason that God impressed my mind to share this verse with you is because we are really living in the very last moments of this earth's history. This evening, in my final presentation, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the realities of what's happening as it relates to end time prophecy. And that we can really get a clear picture by the grace of God of really understanding where we are in time and what the Lord wants us to do about it. And one of the things that I know for a fact is there's only one thing that is going to help bring this world to an end as a result of the ushering in of the coming of Jesus living in these very serious and solemn times. And it is none other than the blessed herald of the first, the second, and the third angel's message. There is no other message that can be properly proclaimed and rightly received that can prepare a people to meet their God. There is no other message, and I can prove that. Go to Revelation 14. In Revelation, the 14th chapter, the Bible actually spells out quite clearly that this is the last message that is to be faithfully given and faithfully received before the Lord comes. In that first angel's message, we have a very solemn instruction it was John the Revelator who made it clear that he saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having, it was in his possession, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell upon the earth. That's verse 6. But in verse 7, it talks about the message that the angel is giving, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth the sea and the fountains of waters. Well, the second angel tells us that Babylon has fallen, has fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The third angel's message is largely a warning, but then also an experience. In verses 9 to 11 of Revelation 14, it's all warning. Now, no one gets saved merely by a warning. Would you agree with that? And that's why when we preach the third angel's message, we should not give so much of an emphasis on the warning without giving the emphasis on the solution. Amen? In verses 9 through 11 is all warning. If any man worship the beast in his image, receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. That's all warning. And I can warn you all day long, that does not in and of itself bring salvation to you. Are you following? The warning must be given for the warning is the motivator to seek salvation. Are you following that? The warning has to be given for it is a motivator to seek salvation. No problem with that. So in other words, give the warning. Do not pull away from the warning. But what God wants us to emphasize after the warning is verse 12. And in verse 12 is the solution. Verse 12 says, now, in the midst of this warning, in the midst of the beast's power getting ready to inflict and impart its mark upon the people, it says, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. That's the experience that will protect us from the thing that we were being warned about. This is where the last day messengers must emphasize in all of our proclamations. Now, verses 14 and 15. Same book, same chapter, Revelation 14, but verses 14 and 15. 
It is in Revelation 14, verses 14 and 15. It is after these messages are faithfully given and faithfully received that the Bible then says what happens next. It's, well, you know what? I think we should consider verse 13. It's reality. In verse 13, it says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, say the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. The reality of faithfully proclaiming this message faithfully receiving this message is that it is going to bring about an agitation by which the people who believe this message will suffer persecution to the point of even death. It's called martyrdom. And so the Bible is very clear that as a result of the three angels' messages being faithfully given and faithfully received, eventually it will bring about persecution by which the people, many of them, will be martyred. And we need to be okay with that. We need to be okay with that. If you're not okay with that, that means that you need to have a deeper walk with Jesus. Because it's a reality. We are already seeing people being persecuted for standing for gospel principles where they, not are, they are not necessarily even going as deep as three angels. Today, if you just simply say you don't believe that the lifestyle of a LGBTQ, if you just say that, it can equate to some very serious persecution to the point that people will get violent with you. In a land of so-called religious freedom, here it is that if we make that statement, it seems like nowadays you can literally get hurt. That is just a snapshot of what many of God's people will go through as we give the fullness of the three angels' messages before a world and a church dying in sin. And so the reality is, is that this is something that is going to follow after the three angels' messages are faithfully proclaimed and faithfully received. It is our reality, and we need to be okay with that. There's a little book called Messages to Young People that says that those who are God's last day messengers will have the model that will say death before dishonor of God and his law is the Christian's model. Let me repeat that. That's worth repeating. Those of us who are really standing for the truth as it is in Jesus in such a time as this in earth's history, we're going to have to get to a place that you're not going to consider your job as much. You're not going to consider your, your, your money, your income. You're not going to think so much about what will happen to my ministry. These things are to be left in the hands of God. He has given us a message and we are to give it unapologetically. And in giving this message... And in receiving this message, I hope you notice that I am very intentional in saying the three angels' message faithfully proclaimed, faithfully received. Did you, uh, did you notice I'm being intentional about that? Oh, yes, that's on purpose. It is not enough to know the three angels. You must experience it. There is an experience in every single one of those messages. And today, I get to teach you the foundation of each of these messages. God wants us to understand that as we faithfully proclaim, faithfully receive this message, that it is going to bring about dislike. People are just not going to be happy, and I don't care how many times you smile and tell the truth. We are to do everything possible to be personable. We are to do everything possible to demonstrate that we are people of kindness. We are to do everything possible to let people know, listen, as much as lies within me, my desire is to live peaceably among all men. But you will find that no matter how nice you are, no matter how beautiful your smile is, no matter how kind your tone is, when you begin to stand for truth and you begin to take it away from the Adventist circles and you take it to the people, you are going to discover the word enemy and hatred like you've never seen it before. Right now, in Adventism, amongst each other, we annoy each other. And it's very different from hatred. We annoy each other. I mean, I, I, listen, I remember a young man came to me, he said, Brother Lemon, he said, um, hey, you know, what, what, what should I look forward to? I want to be an evangelist like you. What, what should I look forward to in this work? 
And I knew this young man, so this is why I said this to him. This is not going to be my counsel to everybody. Don't be afraid to come to me for counsel. But this is what I said to this young man because I knew him. He said, Brother Lemon, I want to be an evangelist like you are and so on. And he said, what, what's your counsel to me? And I said, my son, I said, you must learn to walk so close to Jesus that you know how to live with a knife in your back. What would you think about that? In other words, I said, listen, I said, often you will find sometimes that as you stand for the truth as it is in Jesus, in this beloved movement, there will be many that will shake your hand and smile in your face. But when you turn around, it's spiritually speaking, of course, they will put a knife in your back. I cannot tell you how many times that I've been told in my face, we appreciate your messages. And then somehow some spreading around of words would testify that those individuals did not appreciate those messages. People would say, hey, brother, good to see you. Where deep down in their hearts, they're not happy to see you. And they wish you would go away. We're surrounded by people who are insincere. And so I just gave him a warning to say, do not get into this work to try to win friends. I said, if you get in this work, whether they pat you on the back or whether they stab you in the back, you be faithful to what God has called you to do and you love them anyhow, just like Jesus. That was my counsel to him. This message, brothers and sisters, make no mistake about it, when it's faithfully given, and faithfully received, it is going to bring persecution no matter how nice you tell it. But verses 14 and 15 tells us what will come next. It says in verses 14 and 15, it says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap for the what? For the harvest of the earth is ripe. The three angels' messages, faithfully proclaimed, faithfully received, it brings about harvest time. And if you don't know what harvest time represents in the spiritual sense, you just write down, if you mark your Bibles or if you're taking notes, you just write down Matthew 13 and verse 39. And in Matthew 13 and verse 39, Jesus was decoding the parable of the sower and the parable of the wheat and the tares. And as he was at that point in the wheat and the tares part, he was decoding some of those symbols in the parable. And he said the harvest represents the end of the world. And so it is that the Bible is very clear. This is the last message, the first, the second, and the third angel's message. It's the last message to be given to the world that's going to usher in the second coming of Jesus. But you know what? I've learned that there's things that give power to a message. I'll give you an example. In volume one of the Testimonies to the Church, page 337, let me repeat that. In volume one of the Testimonies to the Church, page 337, in the history of our movement, of which volume one records it, the development, of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It was in volume one of the testimonies, page 337, that there was an elder that decided to go ahead and preach about the Sabbath day. And as he began to preach about the Sabbath day, as he began to do that, Ellen White got an opportunity to comment on his messages as he was proclaiming the Seventh-day Sabbath. And what she said to him was amazing. And here's what she said. She said in volume one, of the Testimonies to the Church, page 337, she said, your proclaiming of the Sabbath had no difference than what the Seventh-day Baptist would have said. Now, does that sound like a compliment? That doesn't sound like a compliment. That sounds like a potential correction. So she was not speaking in a positive tense. She was speaking in the negative tense, and she was correcting him. What she said was, your message 
of proclaiming the Sabbath was no different than what a Seventh-day Baptist would have done. But then she said, but had you taught the Sabbath in connection with the messages? So I was like, the messages? What messages is she talking about? She goes on a couple of sentences later, and she says, had you connect the preaching of the Sabbath with the three angels' messages? She says, a power would have attended your teaching that would have stirred the minds of the hearers. So it's possible to preach or teach a message even with accuracy, but it has no power. Are you following that? What is the foundation? Is the three angels' messages in and of itself powerful? I don't believe that at all. There is something. It's kind of like making a banana bread. Can you imagine making banana bread and you forgot the bananas? I mean, like, that's just a waste of exercise. You get what I'm saying? You don't make a carrot cake and forget the carrots. You don't make carob chip cookies and forget the carob. The three angels' messages in and of themselves have no power. There's a foundation to them that when that foundation's present and then you preach it, whoo, it has convincing power. And I want to talk about that. If the foundations be destroyed, there's nothing the righteous can do, family. And God has given us the last message to give to the world. But if it's missing this foundation, our message is simply making noise. But it has no real, true, transforming power. And I'm about to let you know why some of our homes are so challenged. There's a lot of us that are teaching three angels in our home, but it's having no power with our children. Our children are sitting and listening to the messages and they're going through counsel and they're just waiting for two numbers, one, eight. And a lot of our youth today are saying, yes, mommy, yes, dad, I've watched this. Oh, my friends, I've watched this many a times over. I've watched children, yes, mommy, yes, daddy, amen, and the list goes on and once something happens, once that number 1-8 comes into their lives, for many a youth today, it's almost like they get possessed. When that number 18 kicks in their age, they begin to think, ah, now I don't have to listen to my mother and father as much anymore. Now I don't have to follow all these counsels that I grew up hearing so much. Now I get an opportunity to kind of just go and live my own life and do what I want to do without my parents' interference. It is in the circles of those who preach and teach present truth that we are watching once their children get to adult age, they are gone. Some of them are in the church and mentally gone. Many of them are out of the church and gone, gone. And you know why that is to a very large degree, family. And as parents, we need to accept it. Many of us taught many things about the three angels, but we forgot the foundation. Amen. What is this foundation? Well, here it is that on the screen, we have first at the top, we have second in the middle, and third angel at the bottom. I began to study this, and I began to look at each of these. There are four components to the three angels' messages, okay? Or four components rather to the first angel. Four components. When you look at the first angel's message, there are four things we have to understand. Fear God, give glory to him, hour of his judgment, worship. Isn't that right? That's the four points in the first angel. Fear God, give glory to him, because we're in the hour of his judgment, and worship him. That made heaven and earth, etc. Well, as I began to look at that, I want you to notice what the Bible says. Let's take a look at Proverbs 8. In Proverbs 8, when I started to think about what does it mean to fear God, we're going to do some Bible study. We are going to study our Bibles. In Proverbs, the 8th chapter, I want you to see what the Bible says here. 
What are we dealing with? Often when you ask individuals, what does it mean to fear God? We often say reverence him. I don't have a problem with that. That is true, especially if you look it up in the Hebrew or the Greek. It does bring about the principle of reverence. But there has to be a motivation to reverence anything. There has to be a motivation. Why, why am I motivated? You cannot just go to somebody and say, reverence God. You can't do that. I have to be motivated to do that. Are you following? So I want you to watch this. So when I look at Proverbs 8 and verse 13, when we're dealing with the question of how do you really fear God? Well, here it is that in Proverbs 8 and verse 13, if you're there, say amen. amen. Well, the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is to what? Hate evil, pride, arrogancy, the evil way, and the forward mouth do I hate. Now, the reality is, is that to truly fear God, it is to hate evil. Everything that came after the word evil are all of the things connected to evil. What are the things that are connected to evil? Pride, arrogancy, of course, the evil way, and the forward mouth. These things are ultimately what sums up evil. So to fear God is to hate evil. But then there's a question. The question I have comes from Jeremiah 13. So if you go to Jeremiah 13, let's notice what the Bible says there. In Jeremiah, the 13th chapter, I want you to watch what the Bible says here. Because again, God calls us to the last message of love, hope, and warning to be given to a world. The message must be faithfully given, but it also must be faithfully received. It will bring about harvest time if it is done and received right. But the problem is, is that there's a foundation to these messages that I think a lot of us have overlooked. And if this foundation is destroyed, there is nothing we can do. And so it is that we're looking at the messages more carefully. In the first angel's message, the first instruction is to fear God. Well, what does that mean? That means to hate evil. But we have a problem, Jeremiah 13. In Jeremiah 13 and verse 23, it's a question that God wants you and I to answer. The question says, can the Ethiopian change his skin? What's the answer? Can the leopard change his spots? What's the answer? Then the question is, then how can you do good when you're accustomed to doing evil? In other words, you can't go to people and just say, stop doing evil. When they're like, all my life I've done evil. How do I just stop? It's in my DNA to do evil. What do you mean stop doing evil? It's almost like it's a ridiculous statement. The Bible literally says we're accustomed to it. The word accustomed in the Hebrew means taught. We've been taught it, and as a result of being taught it so well, it became who we are. So there has to be, again, a motivator that moves us from evil to something else. That motivator is Psalms 97 in verse 10. You see, how can I really hate evil when I'm accustomed to doing evil? How do, you, how do you get a man or get a woman to do that? It's actually very logical, but I want you to see how the Bible spells it out. In Psalms, the 97th division, I want you to see what the Bible says. Psalms, the 97th division. We are now going to consider verse 10. This is how you and I can hate evil, and it's actually quite logical. In Psalms, the 97th division and verse 10, I want you to know what the Bible says. In Psalms 97 and verse 10, what does it say? It says, ye that what? Love the Lord. Ye that what? Love the Lord. Then what do we do? Hate evil. Hate evil. Now notice that. What comes first? If I love the Lord, then I can hate evil. Last night I was talking to all my young brothers and sisters and I was talking about how I used to be in the entertainment industry and I was very heavy into it. I ate, drank, and slept hip-hop. I used to call myself hip-hop. I used to say, I used to wake up in the morning and say, I am hip-hop. And I remember that I was so intertwined with hip-hop culture and hip-hop lifestyle. And there's something that's promoted in hip-hop culture that is a very serious evil. It's not just in hip-hop culture, it's in many other types of cultures, but it's definitely in hip-hop culture, which is a powerhouse in this world. And that is to be something called a player. Now, in hip-hop culture, there were guys that were called players. A player was somebody who was not faithful to one woman. They would move around from one woman to another woman to another woman. 
They were called players. So if you were involved in hip-hop culture, you were literally encouraged to be a player. So that's what I was. I was a player. And so I did not have respect for women, and I did not have a lot of women around me that respected themselves. And so it is that it was very easy to disrespect women, and it was easy to use them, hurt them, break their heart, do all sorts of evil things. I didn't know any better. My father caught me in the middle of the act at 15 years old and pulled me out of the room. And when he pulled me out of the room, I thought for sure I'm going to get the beating of my life. And my dad pulled me out of the room, and he looked at me with a straight face, and he said, good job. And my father congratulated me for practicing fornication at 15 years old. He didn't realize the damage that he was doing to me by encouraging me to live that kind of life. This is why, as I told those young people last night, I said, if you're growing up in a home where you have a father and a mother that believes in prayer, that believes in morning and evening worship, that believes in counseling and instructing according to the Bible, that believes in attending church faithfully, I said, you have no idea how blessed you are. Because I grew up in a home nothing like that. So here it is, I'm growing up a player. And one day, one day, I come in contact with this present truth. I learned this gospel and I begin to understand it. And here it is that my wife, I met my wife at a Bible study. And as I began to walk with my wife and court with my wife, I discovered something. It was quite amazing. I realized that I was so thoroughly attracted to my wife, mental, physical, and spiritual, that I discovered something. And I remember I told it to her, I said, Alexandra? She said, yes. I said, something strange is happening. She said, what's that? She said, I said to her, I think I'm falling in love with you. And I never fell in love with anybody. But everything I knew about love, I said, I think this is what's happening to me right now. And as I began to tell her about how much I think I'm falling in love with her and everything else, this is what I discovered next. As I discovered I'm falling in love with her, she was always on my mind. We're always talking. We're making up excuses to never get off the phone. I mean, just loving on each other. I remember one time I went somewhere, and a young lady came to me and said, hey, you want to be with me? And she had all the right everything that normally I would have said, absolutely. But you know what I said to her? I was like, nope. Amen. And she was just kind of like, you sure? I was like, positive. And she was just kind of like, okay. And I'm kind of like, what was that? (laughs) Like normally I'd have jumped, I'd have been like, absolutely. What? And I discovered something very powerful. Love for God, love for Alexandra killed the player that was in my heart. Love murdered an adulterer. And do you know love can murder a murderer? Did you know love can murder somebody that does not honor their father or their mother? Did you know love can destroy Sabbath breaking? Love is what gets you and I to a point that we can hate evil. If you don't have love for God, newsflash, you will never hate evil. You can say it all you want. You can say, I hate evil, I hate evil, and you will discover that your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. It's going to take a lot more than talking yourself into it. That's not how this works. My brothers and my sisters, the foundation of the first angel's message is love. Somebody one day said, Brother Lemon, describe Jesus in one verse. I said, no problem, Hebrews 1. Go to Hebrews 1 with me. Somebody said, describe Jesus. Describe what Christ's life was like on this earth. Give me one verse. I said, only one? They said, yep, only one. I said, all right, Hebrews 1. And I want you to see what it says in Hebrews. In Hebrews 1. And this is what I found, is that the more that we fear God, oh my, look at this. In Hebrews 1, I want you to watch what the Bible says. Hebrews 1. 
And I want you to see what the Bible says, Hebrews 1 in verse 9. This is talking about Jesus. Hebrews 1. And again, notice the order. In Hebrews 1, right there in verse 9, talking about Jesus, it says, Thou hast what? Loved righteousness. And as a result of him loving righteousness, what was his, uh, what was his additional reality? He hated iniquity. That's how you hate evil. You can't hate evil without a love for righteousness. It will never work. It won't be long-lasting. The foundation of the first angel's message is love. Love for God. Love for your fellow man. Deep enough, when you look at the second angel's message, Revelation 3.19. If you look at the second angel's message, the second angel's message is a dealing with a call to Babylon. Isn't that right? When you look at the call to Babylon, we're not speaking to brick and mortar, are we? We're not telling bricks to come out of it, are we? No, we're coming to people. Isn't that right? But what are we exposing about Babylon? We're exposing her sins. Isn't that correct? That is called rebuking. You're exposing an error for the purpose of calling someone into righteousness. So the foundation of all rebukes is in Revelation 3 and verse 19, isn't it? And what does Revelation 3, 19 say? It says, as many as I love, what do you do next? I rebuke and chasten. I would submit unto you do not rebuke a man until you first love the man. When you have a love for the man that's Christ's love, you will be qualified to rebuke them. Let's not get overly literal with the writings of inspiration. It is not so much. There are times that, yes, a rebuke may be given and you may cry. That, that, that's true. That's, that's 100% true. But there are many times you're going to give a rebuke that's after the order of God, and there's not going to be a tear Amen. upon your face. But you will have a heart longing for the soul that you're rebuking. I mean, like a real heart longing for the soul, and you're going to do a little bit more, and we're going to talk about the little bit more. But God wants us to understand, do not rebuke a man if you don't love the man. Do not rebuke the woman if you don't love the woman. It'd be better for you to be quiet and plead with God, Lord, give me your love so that I can rightfully rebuke this individual so that my rebuking is not repelling them but drawing them. It's a very important principle, family. Even Jesus' rebukes were designed to draw, not to repel and make them go away. The foundation, can you imagine that, of the second angel's message is love. But wait a minute, third angel. The third angel we know is a call to fear God, as Brother Chad brought out beautifully. Fear God and keep his commandments. Isn't that right? We do this by having the faith of Jesus, no doubt. But what does John 14, 15 tell us? That no one can keep God's commandments without the reality of John 14, 15 being in their lives. What does it say in John 14 and verse 15? It says in John 14 and verse 15, it says, if you love me, then do what? Keep my commandments. So that means that all those patient saints are a whole bunch of people that love God more than their own lives. The foundation of the first angel, the foundation of the second angel, the foundation of the third angel's message is the love of God. And if you teach that thing in your home but you don't have that, you will produce hard children. Because we have a hard message. And if the love of God is not intentionally brought out, we will pass on something to our children that we will regret. We will look back and say, Lord, I've teach my child to become an automation. But I did not teach them how to walk in the light and the love of Jesus Christ in their obedience. It's a very interesting thing when you get to pull a child aside, and I don't say this in any type of sneaky way. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. But if you pull a child aside and say, as a youth, why do you follow Jesus? You go to a youth and you say, do you love Jesus? And let's say you have a young person that says, oh, yes, I do. Then you ask them the real question. 
Tell me why. You would be amazed at the alarming amount of young people that are in church and following a God they do not neither know nor love. That's scary, family. We're teaching them to be just little Pharisees. A whole lot of good external obedience. Your dress is long. You practice all the principles of modesty. You eat nothing but plants. Now listen to what I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying this as a man who teaches and is demonstrated in my home wearing long skirts. I'm saying this as a man that only eats plants. I only eat plant-based food. That's all I eat. I'm saying this as a man that lives in the country. I'm saying this as a man that, that is doing the reforms. I am not here to take away from one reform. I am not an apostate. Amen. I'm serious. This is not an apostate that stands before you. I am not here tearing away the truths that God has given to us. We are the last effort of the reformation. We are a people of reform. So there's no way that you can steal away from Sabbath reform, education reform, recreation reform, and the many other reforms. We are reformers. Amen. But I have learned that I can be more faithful to the external practice of the reform and be a dwarf in the foundation of that reform that takes it from bitterness to sweet. And there are a lot of people practicing dress reform because they have to, but they long after the garments of Babylon. There are a lot of young people today, and that's what we talked about. We had real talk with our young people yesterday. We showed them the greatest danger that our young people are going through right now is that thing called want to be. It's one of the greatest dangers, especially of homeschool, seven-day Adventist, present truth kids. They want to be like the world. There's something about their Adventism that's been handed down to them that is not meeting their needs. It's not satisfying. So as a result of that, they want to be something else. And that's what you see in our youth at an alarming level. But if we could learn how to teach and preach and proclaim and demonstrate the Blessed Herald of the first, second, and third angel and teach it super saturated with the love of God in its purity, my brothers and sisters, that thing will have such a magnetic power that you can actually have a generation of youth that will say, death before dishonor of my God and his law. It's not just the Christians, it's my motto. And that's the generation of youth that we must produce by the grace of God. But it gets even deeper because I'm talking about the home and I'm talking about us in the church, etc. But then you got Jesus in Matthew 5, 43 and 44, talking even a little bit further about this foundation and who it should be directed to. And notice who it should be directed to. According to the verse, it says, you have heard that it hath been said Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Then in verse 44, but I say unto you what? Love your enemies. Pray or bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. The foundation of this present truth is a love that's so powerful and so strong that it does not enable us to love family and friends only, but it actually enables us to love people who literally wake up every day and all their desire is is to hurt you. You got some people like that in your life? They live, move, and have their being to hurt you, to tear you down, to always make you look like you're dumb and you don't know what you're talking about. They want to do everything possible to mess with your head and to put you back into a state of anxiety and depression. They want to just make sure. They, their joy is watching you crash. You got any people like that in your life? If you don't, you will. And what God says is that I need to develop a people. And you know, this is what hurts me so bad, and I'll be honest with you. As I was telling my dear brother Wayne, and as we were driving up when he picked me up from the airport, I said, my favorite subject my favorite subjects to talk about as it relates to the gospel, health and the family in light of last day events. 
Those are my favorites. Those are, those are my burning passions within my heart to deal with health and the family in light of last day events. That's, that's Dwayne Lemon all day long. If anybody knows me, they know I love my family. By the grace of God, I'll do anything to make sure that my family are going to know Jesus and be prepared to meet their God. Amen. When I get around other women, and, and you know, I understand, I'm not, I'm not some great looking guy anyhow, but I'm just saying, when I get around a sister, I carry an atmosphere about me that lets her know, don't even think about it. Amen. Like, just don't even play yourself and even think about it. When my wife walks around, she gives off an atmosphere that she lets those brothers know, don't even think about it. We don't have no time for that kind of stuff. We are very intertwined as a family. And therefore, it hurts my heart so much when I go places and I see families that are fighting with each other. Husbands and wives that literally will come to church, sit next to each other, and they know she's like, I have a problem with him. And he is like, I have a problem with her. But they're going to keep it quiet, and they're going to put on their happy Sabbath fake faces, and they're going to say amen to the sermon. And when they pull up at the church, they're arguing, woman, this, this, man, this, this. All right, we're at church. Put on the face. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Praise the Lord and all this stuff. And then when church is over, okay, God bless everybody. And they get in the car. They start driving down the road. They look behind. All right. Boop. They take that face off. And they're like, now back to what we said. And they're back at it with each other. And I'm thinking to myself, how do we do that? Some of us have gotten to a place in our walk with God. We've mastered it. We've mastered carrying bitterness, anger, and resentment one toward another, and yet still worship God in spirit and in truth. How do you do that? I'm thankful. I got issues, I can assure you. I, I, your brother has issues. I need help daily. But that's not one of them. I just, I don't know how we harbor anger towards our spouses and still worship. The Bible says, leave your gift at the altar and go be reconciled. Then go offer your gift after you guys work it out. But we bypass that counsel. And so what's happening in Adventism to a very large degree is we have a generation of workers and preachers and teachers and all sorts of righteous stuff going on while we do not have a firm and strong and enduring foundation. And what we don't realize is we're setting ourselves up for failure. You know that I've learned something about Satan? He's patient too. He will see you on the wrong track and he will sit back and say, Look, go ahead, have success, have a great explosive ministry. And he'll just wait for the right time. And he will launch a punch on us that will knock us flat on our feet. And when we get knocked down, a whole lot of people get knocked down too, kind of like the domino effect, because we're prominent ministers. I speak that to, to, that to those of us. Let me tell you something. For those of us who stand at the desk before the people, this is a very sacred work. It is a sacred work because now Dwayne Lemon cannot fall. If I fall, family, I will not fall by myself. I am fully aware of that. I have to be doubly careful because of the position I stand. I got people all over the world, all over the planet, literally, that reach out and let me know we love your ministry, we follow your ministry, et cetera, et cetera. And it blows my mind today because I'm just an ignorant fisherman, but it's amazing what God can do. But I've realized that, man, I'm in a position of responsibility. I got to be doubly careful because it's not just my own soul there's a lot of other people that i know will be affected and impacted that if i fall and god has taught me keep yourself centered in my love let this be the foundation of your studies now when we talk about this we're dealing with first corinthians 13 right first corinthians 13 i want you to consider this wonderful quote it comes from 
Review and Herald, July 21, 1904. It says, the Lord desires me to call the attention of his people to the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Read this chapter every day and from it obtain comfort and strength. Learn from it the value that God places on sanctified, heaven-born love. And let the lesson that it teaches come home to your hearts. Learn that Christ-like love is of heavenly birth and that without it, all other qualifications are worthless. Now, you know what I like about this quote? I like many things about it, but you know one of the things I really like about it? It, it really differentiates from yours and my love. It talks about sanctified, heaven-born love. Why do I say that? Maybe, maybe I'm not the only one. I might be the only one. And if I'm the only one, it's still true anyhow. But I got a feeling I'm not the only one. You ever had somebody do something flat out ungodly, but they said, I'm telling you this because I love you. Yeah, you have you ever had that experience? I mean, somebody has done something that you can compare their action to about 20 verses and a hundred spirit of prophecy quotes, and you know you were wrong for what you just did. But they will tell you, I'm only doing this because I love you. Am I the only one that had that experience? I didn't think so. Do you understand why I'm emphasizing sanctified, heaven-born love? We often tell people, I love you. Oh, no, 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 it's because I love you. We'll tell people that, but the problem is, you may be sincere, but the problem is, it's your love, which is not sanctified, which is not born of heaven, which is not Christ-like. It's human manufactured love. It's very conditional love. You know, most husbands and wives today, if you ask a husband and wife, I do a lot of things in marriage nowadays because I see the crisis and I want to be a solution to it. So do you know one of the things that you ask an average husband? Do you love your wife? If he's smart, he's going to say yes. But here's where it gets concerning. Why? You ask the wife, do you love your husband? If she's wise, she's going to say yes. You ask her why? You know, what a lot of them, you know what a lot of them say after that? Because of what he and she does for me. And you know what my question is next? What if they can't do it anymore? What if your wife just can't do it anymore? I love my wife because she always prepares my meals and when I come home, it's already ready and hot. Well, what if she can't do it anymore? What happens to your love? I love my husband because he always compliments me. What if he doesn't compliment you anymore? I love my husband because he always calls me during the day and gives me hugs, etc. What if he doesn't call you anymore? What if he doesn't give you hugs anymore? I love my wife because she's so considerate of my needs. Well, what if she stops considering you? For a lot of us, you know what we do? There's an aspect of our love towards them that it, it gets cut off. And we violate the very covenant that we made, and we're people of covenant. I promise to love blank in sickness and in health, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, till, oh, you know it, <laughs> till death do we part. Do you know how many of us violate that covenant on a regular basis? Because we're not loving them in spite of. That's what you said at the marriage thing because you were overwhelmed by emotion. You was like, I can't believe he's going to be my husband. He's going to be my wife. We were just excited. But we didn't understand that heaven was a witness that day you got married. Heaven was there. Jesus said, I Everybody else might think you're joking. Jesus said, I'm taking exactly what you said seriously. And so when the problems come up, that's why I'm telling you the truth. You got to remember, family, the trials of life are God's workmen showing unto us the roughness and impurities of our own characters. Messages to young people, 117. Trials reveals who you are, who I am. 
And so it is that the problem that a lot of us are facing is that we are trying to give a message. We're doing YouTube videos. We're doing all sorts of book distributions. We're going around selling and producing DVDs. We're going around preaching and teaching, raising up tents. And the problem is we have a phenomenal structure and a very weak foundation. And the devil's ready to just knock it down. And what God wants us to understand is if the foundation be destroyed, there's nothing you can do. Go to 1 Corinthians 13. Let's take a look at something here. I think this is very interesting. 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. I really enjoy studying this. This, this has been so eye-opening for me. I just feel so bad it took heart surgery for me to realize it. It took my chest being split open for me to get this point that God was trying to bring across all along. I went through a conversion experience through my heart surgery, December 19, 2016. While man was performing surgery, God was performing surgery. Amen. And God gave me a brand new mind. I see the gospel clearer than I've ever seen it before. I know what God wants. And the scary part is God is sending me now to all these hardcore present truthers to kind of help them see what God wants. And it's a very difficult task, and I solicit your prayers. And I mean it. Kind of feels a little bit like Saul turning into Paul. In 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, I want you to watch the verses, right? Verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not love, I am become as sounding brass, or tinkling symbol. And though I have the gift of prophecy and what? Understand how much? Understand all what? Wait a minute. Did you ever pay attention to what that's saying? There are two mysteries that fits very much the very last moments of earth's history. Two mysteries. One is in Revelation 10:7, the other one is in Revelation 17:7. Both of these mysteries are as opposite as night is from day, but they're both mysteries. In Revelation 10, 7, it talks about the mystery of God, which Colossians 1 tells us is Christ in you, the hope of glory. True righteousness by faith. That's a mystery of God. Revelation 17, 7 talks about the mystery of the woman and the beast and their power that's dealing with the end time events of the final crisis the mark of the beast the sunday law and all of the things that come attached with it mysteries paul says even if we understand righteousness by faith in its fullness even oh please watch this even if we understand all the movements of the beast power in its fullness if you don't have love it profits you nothing and it will profit no one that listens to you righteousness by faith revealing the beast and his image and his power i mean that's present truth of present truth and the bible says if you understand it in its full, you understand all mysteries. But if you don't have the love of God as the foundation to it, it's not going to benefit you. And it won't benefit any of the people around you. That is so deep to me. I mean, I hope you let that sit for a little while. Just let it sit for a little while. Even if you understood all of that. It benefits you nothing. But then Paul begins to expound, doesn't he? He says in verses 4 to 8. Now, can we read that together? If you don't mind, I want to hear your voice. In verses 4 to 8 of 1 Corinthians 13, this is what it says. I'm going to replace the word charity with love, for that's what the word charity means. Here we go. Rev I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8. It says, love suffers long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. 
does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, love never fails. Now watch this. So what I did here is I wanted to break all of those down. So I began to look all of these things up in their original language. I wanted to get the deepest meaning of what it was saying. This is what God wants you and I to have as a foundation in our proclamation of the everlasting gospel to all the people that we come in contact with, friends, family, strangers, and even enemies. God says, number one, love is long-suffering. What that means is, is that no matter how much somebody makes me suffer, I will not angrily endure, I will patiently endure it. How are you doing with that? How are you doing with that? Patiently enduring it. There's a contentment in the midst of your, in, of, of your suffering that you're like, you know what? It's all right. The Lord has me. And therefore, I will patiently endure this. Next, kind. The word kind means benevolent. It means that you have a constant desire to help others. Do you have a desire to help others? Even your enemies? Even the one that says, I am completely against you. I don't like what you... If at all possible, I want to hurt you and your family. Are you benevolent towards them? Listen, I'm really talking about what helps qualify us because the, these meetings are so interesting to me. Well, I'll get to that in a second. Envies not. That means we do not covet. We are we're, we're to be jealous. Of, we're not jealous of anybody. Love does not envy. It doesn't covet what belongs to others. We are never in a place that we are experiencing jealousy towards somebody else. Not only that, not puffed up, literally to be boastful and proud. What's your pride? What's, what's your blind spot? You ever sat down and thought about, it, thought about it? What's your blind spot? Where is it that you are suffering with pride in your life right now? Not only that, does not behave itself unseemly. That means that love never carries itself. Anybody who has the love of God in their heart, they would never carry themselves in a way that is unbecoming, indecent, or unattractive. That's really what the Greek means on these words. That means that even when you go outside and present yourself before others, you're actually considering others. Do you know that that would kill all of this nakedness that we see in many churches today amongst the people of God? But it wouldn't just kill nakedness, it would also destroy a lot of this um, strangeness. You know, if I may just speak frankly, you know, a lot of us, some of us who believe in dress reform, we really don't dress up to date. We, we almost make it seem sometimes like dressing up to date might mean compromise to principle or standard or something like that. But that's not what you read in the pen of inspiration. We are all priests. Is that right? Are we part of a royal priesthood? Amen. Does that include male and female? Sure it does. And I'm not here as an advocate of women's ordination. I don't agree with it. But we are still a royal priesthood. Do you know that God had a principle for priests? It was in Exodus 28, 1 and 2. Priests were always to dress for glory and for beauty. So that means that when you get dressed... You want to glorify God. God's glory is his character, so you want to represent principles of God's character in your dress. You should be neat. You should be tidy. You should be clean. You know, things of that nature. That re that's a reflection of God's character. But beautiful. Did you know that God actually wants us to look good? Amen. Now, you know why that's important? I had a sister one time come to my church in New York City, and she came to teach dress reform, and she was literally wearing a big bell-sized hoop dress, and she was wearing a bonnet on her head, and she was trying to teach the young women about how to dress properly. She had zero success. 
She didn't understand the human mind and human nature. If I go to you and I say, you need to know how to dress, you know the first thing the, the human mind does? The human mind goes, isn't that right? Am I right? That's right. We're told in volume four, the testimonies to the church, page 67, that when we do the work of evangelism, we are to understand the human mind and human nature. So when I'm trying to win somebody to God's truth, I have to understand the human mind and human nature. If I'm going to go to people, if I'm wearing a pair of pants that's super baggy and I got it hanging off my backside, I have one side of my hair, obviously this is hypothetical, I have one side of my hair in a big puffy afro and then the other side of my hair in corn braids. I'm wearing a t-shirt and the t-shirt says thug life. And then here it is that I'm going to the guys and I'm saying, we got to learn how to dress like decent people. Do you think I'm going to have success? No, I'm not. A young lady comes and she's wearing a mini skirt. She's wearing a shirt that's so low that her cleavage is just scry screaming out, look at me, look at me, look at me. Everything she's wearing is tight that she can't even walk right. And then she goes to the ladies and she says, ladies, we have to be modest. Is that going to work? No, it's not because in the human mind and human nature says, looks to me like you should follow your own message. That's how the human mind, human nature works. So this sister is wearing a bonnet. She looks like she is ready to go. She looks like she's coming from the 1800s. I used to watch a program when I was a kid called Little House on the Prairie. She looked like one of those characters. And she literally is out there and she's trying to tell these sisters in the city, affected by city, like, you need to practice dress reform. So they looked at her and said, so what you're saying is, is I need to dress like you. And therefore, they said, it's not going to happen. <laughs> Do you know that when we have the love of God in our heart, it'll change how you dress? Because now you're going to always think about, how can I bless the people? How can I impact the people positively? How can I not compromise principle and standard, but how can I at the same time be winsome to those who look at me? And it's going to cause you. Love will not cause you to dress or present yourself in a way that is unbecoming, indecent, or unattractive. Love will make a man and make a woman make those changes. Not only that, love is not glad when wrong things happen to people. But only when right things happen to people. That's love. That's God's love. He does not rejoice. He's not glad when bad things. You ever had that kind of saying in your heart? Maybe I'm the only one that went through this. But you ever had that experience where you hear something bad that happened to somebody and we say, good for them. They had it coming. You ever said that? Am I the only person that ever said that? Do you know right there you literally testified you were disconnected from Jesus? Can you imagine that? Right there, I testified I was disconnected. You know, we talk about Jesus weeping when he rebukes. You know, another thing that makes Jesus weep? When he watches us suffer the results of what he warned us from. He doesn't go around feeling good, saying, good for them. They deserved it. Jesus says, I tried to warn you. Isn't that what he did in Matthew 23? When he saw those Jews and they were rejecting him, and he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how long I wanted to gather you as a hen would gather her chicks, but you would not. Jesus wasn't going around, see, I told you so. You deserved it and so on. Jesus was weeping because he saw their future. That's how it should impact us. When we see people suffer as a result of the wrong path that we already saw them going on. There's no time for, see, I told you so, I knew it. No, 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 brothers and sisters. It's not the heart of God. Not only that, Love endures trials patiently, watch this, never stops trusting, and constantly remains in a state of hopefulness. Does that reflect you when you deal with people? Finally, love is something that never stops. I'm just saying, I, I, I promise you, 
I promise you, I got it. I got it. This is my message before I go down into the grave, family. There's a thousand videos out there where Dwayne Lemon has pointed out the mark of the beast, pointed out sin and made it very defined. No one can tell me that I don't preach present truth. I'm not, I'm not afraid of any of them. I have more than enough audios and videos out there that I've made it very crystal clear who the beast power is, the antichrist, end time events, and all of that. I've made it very clear. And what I'm telling you is I'm still dealing with end time events. I'm just dealing with an element that a lot of present truthers don't deal with. And I'm telling you right now, we're not going to get off this planet. There will be no second coming of Jesus. There won't even be a final crisis until God can get this point across to the minds and hearts of his people. Where is your heart in dealing with all these folks that we're supposed to warn and get them ready for the final crisis? Do you have God's love towards them? When God says, this is how I want you to love not just your friends but your enemies, I want you to patiently endure with them. I want you to always have a desire to help your enemies. I want you to make sure that there is never a covetous heart between you and your enemy. Never be jealous of them no matter what. Never stand before your enemy as boastful and proud. Do not under any circumstances present yourself before your enemy as unbecoming, indecent, or unattractive in character or in person. Never ever rejoice when wrong things happen to your enemies. Only rejoice when righteousness happens to your enemies. Endure trials from your enemies patiently. Never stop trusting me in the midst of your suffering and always remain hopeful that I will do everything possible to even turn your enemies' hearts around and eventually make them your best of friends. Do not ever let my love cease or die out in your heart towards your enemy. I guarantee you this. Any heart that gets this point will be part of God's team in the finishing of his work. Amen. Guaranteed. And it's that wicked thing. You know what a lot of us say? You want me to love my enemy like that? No way. Not going to happen. You don't understand what my enemy did to me. This is where pride can kick in. You don't understand what he did to me. You don't understand the kind of suffering I went through. You don't understand. And the best way to deal with that is very simple. Ephesians chapter 4. Go there with me. We're going to bring out some final points. I'm going to let you go. I want you to watch this. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, I want you to watch how God answers this question. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, because many of us find our reasons of saying, oh, I, I, can't, I can't forgive my enemy. I can't, I can't love them like this. You don't understand what they did to me. Ephesians chapter 4. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 31 and 32. And notice what the instruction of heaven says. It's very simple. In Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, the Bible says, Let how much? Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be what? Put away from you with all malice. Verse 32. And in contrast, be ye what? Kind one to another. What else? Tenderhearted, finally, forgiving one another. What are the next two words? Even as. Take the words even as out and put just as. Just as God for whose sake? Christ's sake hath done what? Forgiven you. You see, what people did to you is very evil. I'm not taking away from that. My wife gave a testimony of how one day a relative of hers touched her in an inappropriate manner. He should have been put in prison for it, but he wasn't. And my wife, she gave that testimony of how she struggled when she would see him come to the house, knowing what, she, what he did to her and how it impacted her. And here it is, that as my wife received healing from Jesus from that wound, my bride was able to call him. And my bride called him up 
She was very nervous. But she had the courage of Christ with her. And she called him up. And she said, I need to meet with you. And when she met with him, she looked him in the eyes. She says, there's something I have to tell you. And he said, well, what's that? What you will find that's very habitual with uh, molesters and pedophiles and things of that nature, what you'll find that's very consistent is they deny what they've done. It's very, very typical. Well, here it is. She went to him and she says, I am here to let you know something. He said, what's that? She said, in the strength of Jesus, I forgive you for what you did to me. He began to look at her and he said, what are you talking about? And she literally had some spiritual boldness. And she said, I forgive you for what you did to me. She knew he knew. And she just told him, I forgive you for what you've done. You need to repent before God now. What are you talking about? She said, let's pray. And she prayed, and it was over. And she walked out of there a free woman. She realized, like we need to realize, there are gross offenders that has been in our life. People that have done wicked things to us. And naturally, when we see God tell us, love them anyhow, we say, how do you expect me to do that? All I can remember is their offense. And so God gives us that sobering thought where he says, well, remember the offense you did to my son? What has man done to you that's worse than what you did to my son? You know, some of us are even murderers, but we might have murdered one person, but every time we sin, we crucify Christ afresh. This is a true story, what I'm about to share with you, and I have to tell this to you in code. When God made a husband and a wife, there's a privilege that God allowed in the marriage only for the husband and wife. Are you following me so far? Okay. In that privilege that God has only reserved for husband and wife, and there's a reason I'm bringing this point out, in that privilege that God only reserved for the husband and the wife, the husband and wife can get to such a height in that privilege that it brings a lot of pleasure. Are you following me still? You start, you're still following me on that? I got it. I'm trying to do it as code as possible. Now, why, why am I bringing this point out? This is the reason why I'm bringing this point out. True story. There was a woman who murdered a woman in Tennessee years ago. Her story was most compelling to me. When she murdered this woman, while she was stabbing her, you know what happened to her? She had that high experience that only a husband and wife in that privilege are supposed to have. Are you following me? She actually had that experience while watching someone die. We say to ourselves, isn't that sick? Isn't that terrible? And as I was going over this story and looking at this story and saying, how, how, I, don't even understand, I don't even understand how somebody could have that kind of experience murdering someone. God says, it happens every day. You see, there are some of us that when we sin, we enjoyed it. When we committed our sin, it brought pleasure for a moment. And we received fully the pleasure of whatever that sin was that we committed, knowing this is murdering the Son of God afresh. And it's not like we did that once. We did that over and over and over and over and over again. And then God said, Dwayne, what really makes you different from that woman? When we're tempted, we enjoy the temptation. And then after the temptation and we fulfill the sin, we enjoy the sin. While we were murdering afresh, 
the son of the living God. God says, what really makes you different? You see, God agrees with us. That is sick. But the reality is, is that we are sick. That's what Isaiah said. Ah, sinful generation. He said, the whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. Isaiah 1, 4 and 5. That's you. That's me. And here goes Jesus. He said, you know what? You did do that to me. And while you were enjoying every minute of it, it was killing me every minute you were doing it. But Jesus says, but I have such, I have such an unreserved love for you that I'm still willing to take your punishment, which you fully deserve, and I will give you my reward that I fully deserve. And I'm doing it because I love you with an everlasting love. We go to God in repentance. We say, Lord, thank you. Forgive me. God says, freely I forgive you. Come unto me. We come to Christ. And then Jesus says, now receive this love. Let me put this in your heart and now go show others because this is the only way that men will know that you are my disciples. Brothers and sisters, I'm not sure if you're aware of it. We are a fighting church right now. It's like everybody's against everybody. Liberals against conservatives. Precious truth against present truth. Then you got classes of present truth that are against each other. And the world, because we put this stuff on the internet, the world is literally looking at us and saying, and they want us to join this? And that's why I firmly believe those wonderful words, the Lord does not now work to bring many souls into the truth because of the unconverted members and the members who were once converted but have backslidden. That's volume six of the Testimonies to the Church, page 371. Brothers and sisters, God wants us to understand if the foundation be destroyed, you have no real power. I have no real power. You'll do a lot of activity, that's not an issue. But it won't bring about long-lasting change. Jesus really wants to wrap this thing up. But he requires your cooperation in mind. And I admit, I admit it. I, I can admit it in my interactions with fellow workers, in many of my sermons, and in times even in my home even in my devotions with my children, I clearly could see where the love of God was not central. And I saw the fruit of it. I saw the fruit of it, clear as day. And this is why I want to give you this point. I'm going to give this to you in closing. We'll go past this. I'll save this for tonight when we do the study on prophecy. This is so deep. I I'm saving this for tonight. The demon of. Wait till you see this. But we'll go over that tonight. Go past that. This is what I want to leave with you. I want to leave this with you because I, I am telling you from experience what this has done for me. I'm just telling you from experience what this has done for me. I do not negate a single principle of present truth that I have believed in times past. I still hold to them, but now I have a greater glue. I have a greater motivation, and I want you to have this motivation. Where do we begin? Number one, in volume six of the Testimonies, page 55, Christ's favorite theme was the paternal character and abundant love of God. Did you know that? Jesus loved to study love. He loved to study it. He loved to observe it in nature and everything that he did. This is something that I want to encourage you to do. I want you to study like Jesus did, the paternal character and the abundant love of God. Look for it in every devotion. When you have a devotion in the morning, 
Again, I appreciate Brother Chad giving the encouragement to study the Bible every day, etc. And when you do it, I am encouraging you, be intentional. Where do I behold the paternal character and abundant love of God in what I read this morning? You will find that it will make your devotions more meaningful. In addition to that, the greatest virtue, the Bible clearly says, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, the fruit of love, number one, is obedience to God's law and overcoming the beast. The fruit of love is it's the foundation to self-sacrifice. The fruit of love is the foundation to witnessing. Literally, the love of God pushes us into all these different paths of present truth. When you were telling that story about the gentleman that you met who went through the suffering and all these other things, I was sitting there in the back, and as you were talking about that, Brother Chad, I said to myself, you know, when you asked him what, what, what did all these things for him, and I answered in my own heart, I said, 2 Corinthians 5.14, the love of God constrains us. That's why he endured that suffering. He would never endure that suffering if he didn't love God, and neither would you. Nobody would. You will not suffer for a man you don't know and you don't love. You'll do a lot for somebody you know about, but there comes a limit that you're not going to go any further if you do not know the person and truly love the person. You're going you're gonna to put a limit and you're not going to go far. There's a lot of preachers and teachers right now that are doing that. They're giving people just enough truth to keep them lost. They won't go past a certain line. They're like, nope, I'm not going past that line. That'll ruffle too much feathers. We are way past the time of ruffling feathers. Amen. Agitate, agitate, agitate. We're living in that time. Are you kidding me? We got people dying all around us. How many more you want to let die before we finally say, we need to start having some deeper discussions? Amen. You kidding me? We have tons of young people leaving the church, et cetera, going in the road to perdition, and we're still like, well, you know, let's, let's not address certain things. Lady, brother, we late. Not everything has to be on YouTube. Not everything has to be on the internet. But we need to be just as busy for the Lord when the cameras are off as when the cameras are on. The love of God is the only way you'll do it. I'm serious. I have met ministers that are cowards. They will not stand up for certain things. They know it's right, and we'll talk about it quietly behind closed doors, but we will not do it standing before the people because we're afraid of what they'll do to us or what's going to happen to us. We are disqualifying ourselves from being God's representatives in these last days. You got to love people enough to tell them the truth. You got to love people enough to say, look, this is wrong. This is right. Thus saith the Lord and leave the consequences with God. We have to be able to do that. And again, I don't believe that everything has to be done over the world wide web. I'm serious, I, I'm, I'm making that clear. We have counsel against that. But we still have to address some very living issues that's causing people to lose their salvation. Only the love of God will make you do it. Nothing else would do it, real love. Heaven-born love, Christ-like love. Did you know love is mentioned 10 times in the book of Matthew? Four times in the book of Mark, nine times in the book of Luke, but 19 times in the book of John. It's mentioned 28 times in the epistles of John. So therefore, when you, start, when you want to start saying, Lord, how can I become more acquainted with your love? I would like to recommend start carefully and prayerfully going through the writings of the Apostle John, from the Gospel of John all the way through to those four epistles. You will find, uh, uh, well, actually three epistles. You will find that when you go through it, you're going to see so much beauty as it pertains to the love of Jesus. And it'll motivate you. It'll make you stand though the heavens may fall. And finally, when you read it, remember Jesus says, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. For they are they which testify of me. Then he says, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Every time you read, every time you study, be intentional. Where do I see the character of God and behold his love? And I promise you, we have a statement in the book Education, page 192, 
And it says, as the student of the Bible beholds the Redeemer, there is awakened in the soul the mysterious power of faith, adoration, and love. I got to repeat that. That's good stuff. Can I repeat it? Education, page 192. It says, as the student of the Bible. Is that you? Amen. It says, as the student of the Bible beholds the Redeemer, there is, and I love this word, there is awakened. That means that God literally puts it there. It says there is awakened in the soul, and here goes a nice, I love this part right here. There is awakened in the soul the mysterious power. In other words, when the love of God rises up in your heart as a result of beholding the Redeemer and putting his principles into practice, as clearly stated in our earlier message by Brother Chad, God says a mysterious power of three things will rise up in you. Faith, adoration, love. And then it says, upon the vision of Christ, the gaze is fixed. That means you never take your eyes off of him. This is how a young man falls in love with Jesus. That's how a young woman falls in love with Christ. The vision must be, the, the gazing, it, it has to be fixed on him. Sometimes we love studying all the lesser lights and forgetting they lead to the greater light. The only good thing about John the Baptist, the only good thing about Elijah, the only good thing about Peter, the only good thing about Isaiah and Daniel and any of them, the only good thing about any of these prophets, they were all lesser lights of which we saw a reflection of the greater light in them. My goal is not to be like John the Baptist because John the Baptist one day said, are you the Messiah or should I look for another? God doesn't want me to repeat that. My goal is not to be like Elijah. Elijah himself at one point ran away, didn't trust God, and wanted to drop dead after having a major victory. God doesn't want you to repeat that. God doesn't want us to be like Moses, where one day we're walking with the children of Israel, and then next thing you know, we get so annoyed with the children of Israel, when God tells us, speak to the rock, we strike it twice. God does not want us to be like any of these patriarchs or prophets, except it be that the light of Christ was shining through them at the moment they were faithful. I love what Ellen White says about David. The Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. Well, if we only went with that biblical account, we'd be confused. <laughs> but the prophet of God says David was a man after God's own heart when he was following God. You see how clear that is? Brothers and sisters, don't follow Peter in every way. Don't follow John in every way. Don't follow Elijah. There's only one man in the whole story of the Bible that we can follow in every way, and that's Jesus. He's my pattern man. You tell me about John the Baptist, all I know is that he's reflecting what was already in Christ. You tell me about Elijah, he was only reflecting that which was in Christ. You tell me about Martin Luther or any of the wonderful reformers, I only follow them as they were reflecting Christ. My focus upon the vision of Christ, the gaze is fixed. Even when I'm studying the prophets of old, even when I'm studying the reformers, even when I'm studying the pioneers, the vision of Christ, my gaze is fixed. I follow them, as Paul says, as they were following Christ. And I promise you, you study like that, oh boy. <laughs> Get ready to go a little bit higher up Jacob's ladder. I promise you, family, it's beautiful. I am in the sweetest stage of my walk with God. Amen. I'm telling you the truth. I am a very happy man. I'm serious. And I give it to you because sometimes we look like a bunch of sad ventists. God wants us to understand you don't have to be sad and miserable and down and out and all these other things. Listen, I appreciate so much when Brother Chad brought out, you know, you don't always need an agitation taking place from the White House or from the papacy to stay on fire for God. You get to know Christ, you will be a walking flame. Whether there's an agitation coming from the White House or not, whether there's a movement of the papacy or not. And I say this with total respect. 
that there are movements from the White House. I've just told you tonight I'm going to talk about it. So obviously, I'm still a man that believes and advocates end time events and understanding where we are in time as it relates to Bible prophecy. But I don't need, and you'd be amazed at what Ellen White says, I might give you that quote tonight. She actually says, should the terrors of the day be the chief motive for us to seek Jesus? And you know what her answer was? No. And then you know what she said next? She said, Jesus is attractive. Ha! I love that. She says, Jesus is attractive. Jesus is the only man that I could say I'm attracted to. Amen. Brothers and sisters, he wants you to be attracted to him. He wants you to find your all in all in him. I pray God breaks us from this spell that some of us are under. Learn to dwell in his love, to bask in it, to speak it, to talk it, to pray it. Don't be ashamed of it. It's the foundation to the power behind those three angels. And whoever has it, keep watching their ministry. Keep watching the impact they will have in the communities and amongst the people. Whoever gets it, they will be a powerhouse for God. And I'm just pre pleading with God, Lord, help me to get it. Help me every day, Father, to get it more and still more. If that's your prayer, please stand to your feet with me. You will find that Jesus will do more for you than what you can do for yourself. Let this be your motive. Heaven-born, sanctified, Christ-like love. Sure foundation. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful. We truly thank you, Lord, for blessing us and allowing us to just talk a little bit about that precious foundation. It's what causes the three angels' messages to work. Love is the foundation of the first, the second, and the third angel's message, but it's a sanctified, heaven-born, Christ-like love. Father, please forgive us for allowing our human, perverted, manufactured, sinful love to be intermingled with such pure teachings. We pray, dear God, take away this stony heart and give us a true heart of flesh. There are some people in this room that have not forgiven their own spouses. They have for not forgiven their ex-husbands and ex-wives. They have for not forgiven their children. Their siblings that haven't forgiven each other. Lord, we have no hope of salvation. We have no way that we can have true gospel power while these things are in our heart. Give us a clear vision of ourselves and your love and what you did in spite of us. And I pray, help us to learn how to show it to the group that's hardest for us to love, our enemies, the ones that are against us. For Lord, soon and very soon, we're going to understand that word enemy like we never understood it before. And we have to have the love of Christ in us, the hope of glory. I pray, please, help what we discuss today to take deep root within our hearts. And may it be foundational in all that we say and all that we do and all that we think as it relates to the proclamation of these precious messages. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.